picture might be worth a thousand words, but on January 28, 1969, the words in the Pittsburgh press said it all. The previous morning, a 37-year-old named Chuck Knoll had been hired to reverse the fortunes of the worst team in the NFL. Later in the day, the Pittsburgh Steelers selected a little-known defensive tackle with the fourth pick in the NFL draft. Steelers first round selection, Joe Green. And there it was, dutifully reported in so many words, the birth of a pro football dynasty. Andy Russell, number 34, was the Steelers defensive captain, a studious linebacker who'd been around since 1963. Back in the 60s, the Steelers were pretty bad. We just could not consistently win games. We would lose games by the most bizarre circumstances. We'd, we'd find a way to lose every time. So it was a very frustrating experience and quite a remarkable change when Chuck Knoll came. He called me in in the off season. I'd made my first Pro Bowl in 1968 prior to him coming. And I thought, well, he's calling me in to congratulate me. So I went in to see him. Shook hands, but it wasn't overly friendly. And he, he looks at me and he says, you know, Russell, I've been watching the game film since I've taken over the job here. And he said, I don't like how you play. You're too aggressive. You're too out of control. You're trying to be the hero. You're trying to make big plays. I'm going to change the way you play. I'll make you a better player than you are now because you're not disciplined enough. I was just stunned. Then we get to training camp. And the first speech to the team, he said, look, I've been watching the game films since I took the job. And I can tell you guys, the reason you've been losing is not because of your attitude or your psyche or any of that stuff. The problem is, is you're not good enough. You know, you can't run fast enough, you can't jump high enough, you're not quick enough. Your techniques are just abysmal. I'm going to probably have to get rid of most of you, and uh, we're going to move on. And, I, I mean, five of us made it from that room to the 74 Super Bowl. One of those five was the first player the Steelers drafted the day Noel was hired. I had been holding out for probably two, three weeks. The day I signed my contract, they escorted me down to the practice field where I was met by all the offensive linemen. And immediately we did a one-on-one -on -one blocking drill with Ray Mansfield picked him to go first because Ray Mansfield wanted to show him what a veteran will show a rookie. and. Joe destroyed Ray Mansfield, our center for so many years, and we were like, whoa, this guy, this guy can play. Those offensive linemen didn't like me a whole lot. The opposition liked him even less. Joe Green would come in the huddle sometimes and say, I'm taking the ball away this play, and do it. I mean, I've never <laughs> in my whole career ever seen an athlete be able to do that. He's actually unblockable in those early years. He was unblockable, but Joe Green was also uncontrollable. The Steelers won just 12 games in his first three seasons. And on days like this one in Philadelphia, losing brought out the worst in him. <laughs> oh, I acted very poorly. They came over to me and they said, uh, Captain Russell, would you talk to Mr. Green? I said, I don't think so. <laughs> you, know? you know, the clock is ticking away and they're just about to win the ball game. And I, in my frustration, I just was so disappointed. I picked the ball up and threw it into the stands and walked off the field. Well, it's the middle of the fourth quarter. I said, the game's over. I'm sorry. That was, that was not a good day for Joe Green and the Steelers. I just think that uh, Joe Green showed, e even us old veteran players, that uh, there's a different way to think. You know, you can't accept losing. The fiery temper of mean Joe Green would prove to be the perfect complement for the icy cool of Chuck Knoll. Obviously, I'm guessing, but I don't know if anyone would have tolerated my behavior the way Chuck did. What Chuck saw was a very energetic, raw kid that wanted to play and wanted to win. And he knew that it was immaturity and he didn't quash that enthusiasm. He let me get it out. And then he let me mold it in a positive way as he did many of us. Basically, he was saying, it's not what we're gonna do, it's how we're gonna do it.
I'm not going to ever give you a motivational speech because if I have to motivate you, I will fire you. I was playing a game in St. Louis early, early in 69, made my first big mistake. My man caught a touchdown pass. He came down, he stood next to me, he said, uh, Andy, when we gave up that touchdown, uh, what was your thought process? I looked at him, he, said, he wants to know my thought process. As you walked away, I said, there's a guy I want to play for. At the time, I didn't want to be a Pittsburgh Steeler uh, because of the, of, of the history. But, uh, I mean, how could I change it? Couldn't ask for, for a better head coach, a, a, a person that knew what he wanted, knew how to get it. We never saw him crack. He was solid, a rock. Art Rooney owned the Pittsburgh Steelers for nearly 40 years and never won a thing. But no one who worked for him ever called the Chief a loser. The Chief was a great gentleman. He was at every practice. You know, I don't care if it was snowing and cold and winds blowing, he's out there and, you know, and he's got his cigar and he's watching practice. And he, he's all bundled up and then he would talk to us after every practice. He always had something good to say to you, something kind to say to you. He was your boss and you knew that. But he gave the persona that he was a real person and that he cared about those guys in the locker room. In 1970, the old man gave his team a new home. But Three Rivers Stadium wasn't the Steelers' only construction project. After four decades, Art Rooney and his sons were finally assembling a young and talented team. He's a blonde bomber. Yeah. Quarterback Terry Bradshaw and cornerback Mel Blunt arrived in 1970. Linebacker Jack Ham in 71. All three were future Hall of Famers. By 72, Joe Green was flanked on the defensive line by L.C. Greenwood, number 68, Dwight White, 78, and Ernie Holmes, 63. 1972 was also the year the Steelers drafted a fullback from nearby Penn State. It didn't take Franco Harris very long to impress his new teammates. We played a game, I think it was in uh, Atlanta, it was a preseason game. And Franco runs up to the line, looks like he stops and maybe scratches his head, what am I gonna do now? And all of a sudden he goes, <laughs> takes off. Gee, we got one. We got one. Harris rushed for over 1,000 yards in his rookie year, leading the Steelers to the playoffs for the first time in their four seasons under Chuck Knoll. 1972 was, was, was magic. It was like the whole town was waiting for this forever. These fans suffered for so long. And in 1972, it was like a big awakening. Every player had his own fan club. And at the center of it all was the rookie from Penn State. We need to have an army. And so they thought about it. So this kid's half Italian, you know? So. Uh, I was having Franco's Italian Army, and it sounded like a good idea. Franco, let's go, Franco, let's and it just go, caught on fire, and everybody wanted to be Italian. <laughs> what's, 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 what's red, green, and white, man? What's that? Red, green, and white. Italian flag, man. I mean, yeah, Franco in that season. Oh, it was it was a beautiful happening. It, it was a wonderful thing for for Franco for the city of Pittsburgh, for the football team, and for everyone. 50,000 people standing and applauding. Listen to the ovation for Franco Harris. Even Frank Sinatra joined Franco's Italian army. To have uh, the chairman of the board walk on the football field, gee, 
What else? <laughs> it's down to one big play. Fourth down and 10 yards to go. 22 seconds remaining. Bradshaw running out of the pocket. Looking for somebody to throw to. Fires it downfield. And there's a collision. And that, that's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. The immaculate reception delivered the first postseason victory in Steelers history. After 40 years, they were finally winners. Field, heading up Franco's Italian army, charging under the football, and galloping off into the sunset. We had some people together when Franco came, but we didn't win anything. We didn't win any Super Bowls before Franco, and didn't win any after him. After five seasons and two playoff appearances, Chuck Knoll's Steelers were ready for a Super Bowl run. And 1974 began with perhaps the greatest infusion of talent in NFL history. Pittsburgh on a first round selects Lynn Swan, wide receiver, Southern California. Lynn Swan and fellow wide receiver John Stallworth. Center Mike Webster and linebacker Jack Lambert. The Steelers added four Hall of Famers in a single draft. An injury forced Lambert into the starting lineup immediately to the shock of his veteran teammates. To look at Lambert, he doesn't look like a middle linebacker. At 6'5", 218 pounds, he doesn't pass the eye test. But he could play. <laughs> Lambert may have made the biggest impact, but the most talked about player in camp wasn't a rookie. Well, the Pittsburgh Steelers have just completed the exhibition season as the only undefeated team in professional football. There is also a sociological aspect, a kind of sociological undertow to what the Steelers have been doing. The Pittsburgh Steelers are historically one of pro football's have-not clubs. And it may be appetite which has made them innovative to the extent of contemplating in this season of promise the NFL's first successful black quarterback. That quarterback was Joe Gilliam, a third-year pro who had started one game in place of an injured Terry Bradshaw in 73. I came in with Joe Gilliam, and I was just amazed to see this skinny kid throw this football. I could not believe his talent. Gilliam's stellar performance in the 74 preseason created a quarterback controversy in Pittsburgh. It was in the air. It was on the airways. It was on, it was on the radio. They were staring it up. But the calmness was what was happening in the locker room. There was no controversy. It would be bad. In the, it was the plugger in the locker room. It wouldn't be bad. Thinking about it now, imagine the pressure that was on the head coach. Probably wasn't any. You know, Chuck would always tell us that you only felt pressure when you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> would you say realistically that he has a good fighting chance to be our number one quarterback at the beginning of the season? Well, he's, uh, he's done very well in preseason. He's been the, uh, uh, the most productive, and uh, that's what we look at. Whoever's in there, that's my quarterback, and that's what I'm rooting for. It was a surprise decision, but when they made that decision, I was happy for Joe. Tell you what, he loved to throw that ball. Here's Gilliam from the pocket, firing downfield. There goes Swan, closing in at the high touchdown, Pittsburgh. Gilliam not only won the starting job, he passed for over 600 yards as the Steelers scored 65 points in the first two games of the regular season. Joe lit it up, and this is the new Steeler offense. It appeared the Steelers were seeing their future, and so was the rest of America. Yes, that was true. He was black, and he was the quarterback. The Oakland Raiders didn't care who was the quarterback. 
They had beaten the Steelers in the 73 playoffs and bludgeoned them in a week three rematch. They shut us out. And you get shut out on your, on, on your own home, home turf and you're thinking that you are a Super Bowl contending team, that can really shatter you know, your hopes and shatter your confidence. Gilliam threw a pair of interceptions and completed just 10 of his 31 passes. The Oakland Raiders have laid the first defeat on Pittsburgh. Making matters worse, Franco Harris was injured and missed the next two games. Without him, the offense fell apart. Gilliam's play deteriorated. He completed fewer than 40% of his passes over the next three games. But the Steelers won all three behind a defense that was maturing into one for the ages. The front four of Green, Greenwood, White, and Holmes had become dominant. All four were individual standouts. Together, they were the Steel Curtain. The great thing about the front four is, is that they could put all the heat on the quarterback by themselves. They didn't need blitzes. Jack Ham and I and Lambert rarely blitzed. We didn't, we didn't have to. So we were able, therefore, to play pass defense. In the three games after the loss to Oakland, the defense forced 15 turnovers. Pass intercepted, picked off by Jack Lambert at the 15-yard line. We just believed that we could beat a team sometimes by ourselves. I mean, we were going to take the ball away from them and score ourselves. I mean, they were incredible. And they knew we were struggling. And then they stepped it up. You know why? Because they had to. After six games, the Steelers were 4-1-1. One, one. You know, that's not a bad record. We, we certainly weren't embarrassed about that, but there was some sense that we're not, we're not cohesive. We're not coming together. We weren't a contender at this time. We were winning, but for the offense, do we need a change here? From the moment the Steelers made him the first pick of the 1970 draft, Terry Bradshaw was an enigma. We all knew he was an extraordinarily gifted uh, player, an awesome talent. If you stood next to him and watched him throw the football, it was almost mind-boggling how, how good he was. I mean, physically talented. Obviously, it was taking him, and it took all of us, a lot of time to learn how to play the game. He had been struggling with that. Big question mark. Big question mark. Uh... Terry showed signs of being the great player that he is a lot. But, you know, Terry would make mistakes, too. You know, when things go bad on offense, who gets the blame? Quarterback. And, you know, Terry uh, got blamed for a lot of things. In four years, Bradshaw had gone from golden boy to whipping boy. He chafed under the harsh toolage of his head coach. And by the time he lost his starting job in 74, he was emotionally shell-shocked. I think he went into somewhat of seclusion when he wasn't at practice. He was going home to no one and staying home, staying in his apartment. Uh, don't go out to the restaurants that I used to frequent. Uh, don't read the newspapers because they're going to say bad things about you. Uh, so you're crushed a little bit there. I've apologized to him, frankly. I criticized him a few times in the locker room for, you know, a certain kind of behavior or whatever, and, and, and I, was wrong. I was wrong. I mean, I, I should not have done that. Uh, I should have been more sensitive to a young man's, uh, you know, emotions, and I was like, you know, toughen up and you know, just get out there and get it done. You know, the old school kind of thinking, and I think I was wrong. Bradshaw watched the first six games of the 74 season from the sidelines. His team missed him. What is the right combination? What's the thing that gels your team, makes your team productive? Uh, I felt very comfortable with Terry. I always liked Terry. And then I felt Terry was a winner. I wasn't on the stump about it, but when the question came up, I thought Terry was the guy. 
On a Monday night against Atlanta, Bradshaw returned. The backfield that would start in four of the next six Super Bowls was finally in place. For us at that particular time, the running game was our bread and butter with a few passes sprinkled in here and there, you know. Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer, number 20, combined for over 200 yards rushing as the Steelers defeated the Falcons 24-17. It uh, felt good, and I think it just started to lay the groundwork for where we wanted to go. Of course, the defense was already there. In week eight, the Steelers shut out Philadelphia 27-0, holding the Eagles to less than 150 total yards. But Bradshaw was still a colt who had not yet been broken, and Chuck Knoll had little patience for his wild ways. After a loss in Cincinnati, Bradshaw was benched again, this time in favor of veteran backup Terry Hanratty, number five. All of us knew that Terry Hanratty wasn't our future. I mean, he wasn't the future of the Pittsburgh Steelers. In Cleveland, Hanratty completed two passes and threw three interceptions. The quarterback situation was a mess, but the rest of the team was playing at a championship level. Harris ran for 156 yards, and the defense caused seven turnovers as the Steelers rallied to defeat the Browns and remain in first place in the AFC Central Division. In week 11, Bradshaw was back. But in a 28-7 defeat of the New Orleans Saints, he ran for more yards than he passed for. During that game against New Orleans, we went to uh, three running backs. <laughs> In less than two months, Super Bowl IX would be played on the very same field. And that was no laughing matter. I know, I wasn't thinking that we were going to be there. That was the furthest thing from my mind, thinking about being there in the next two months. We had a long way to go. No player on the Steelers loomed larger than Joe Green, and his influence was growing. Late in the 74 season, he developed a new technique called the Stunt 4-3 and convinced his coaches to let him use it. He jumped in the gap between the guard center, tilted his body, and just blew through that gap. And, and it, was, it was devastating. People didn't know what to do. The stunt 4-3 wreaked utter havoc. Teams were forced to commit so many blockers to Green that his teammates often went completely unblocked. Even when they doubled or triple teamed him, offenses felt the wrath of Mean Joe. Unfortunately, so did his own offense after a 13-10 loss in week 12 to the lowly Houston Oilers. We should have beaten the Oilers, and we were going to be a championship team. And we didn't. We just stuck up the place on offense. There it is, there it is! There it is! I said, oh, hell, man, I'm just tired of this. I think after that ball game, something changed. Next night, the Miami Dolphins played the Cincinnati Bengals on Monday night, and they methodically destroyed Cincinnati. And I became so jealous and enraged about that. Why can't we be like that? Why can't we execute like that? Joe uh, had a mind snap, and he said, I'm, I'm through. I can't, I, 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 my only goal is to be on a Super Bowl team. I want to win playoff games. I, want, I, I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't stand this. I'm going to leave. I went to my locker and picked up my belongings, and I 
walked to the parking lot and got in my car. And my actions were that, and my thoughts were that, <laughs> I don't know what they were, but I was leaving, because I'm disappointed. And, uh, but in the midst of all that, I said, boy, I sure hope somebody come out here and stop me. Cooler heads prevailed, and Green rejoined the team for the most important game of the season in New England. Going into New England, if we won that game, we would win a division, and I have to tell you, that was a big emotional high for me, knowing that uh, all the struggles that we went through this past year, all the turmoil, uncertainties, that we're still in this position. With a victory against the Patriots, the Steelers would clinch a berth in the playoffs for the third straight year. You know, I personally was nervous. I remembered the 60s, you know, I was always going back thinking, well, you know, we lost all those games, and is this gonna happen again? And, and are we gonna find some stupid way to lose this game? We had our work cut out for us. But the Steelers made quick work of the Patriots. And here is Bradshaw throwing for Lynn Swan. And Lynn Swan going for it. Swan pulls it in for a touchdown. It felt so wonderful. It was like a big load off our shoulders. I think what we were happy about was not necessarily winning the division, but beating a good team on the road and looking good doing it. They've got him, and it's going to be a two-pointer. That's it. Uh -huh. Two points. There's the safety. There was just a new spirit. Now we're starting again a brand new season. Plus, we have our people in place now. Win or lose, this is, this is who we have. The title of Sports Illustrated's playoff preview read, For Openers, Super Bowl Eight and a Half, a reference to the first round playoff game between the Raiders and Dolphins. The Steelers were described as the only team in the playoffs without a quarterback, and were expected to lose at home to the Buffalo Bills. Here come the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, team without a quarterback, team without this, team without that. The last time the Steelers had faced the Bills, O.J. Simpson had rushed for 189 yards. The Juice had put some yards on us. We were concerned about him for sure. We always did have the ability to rush the passer, put pressure on the passer, make him uncomfortable, create turnovers in the middle of the season. But down in the playoffs, when you meet the best teams, we didn't have success stopping the run. And we knew we had to. Let's go, Juice! Juice, get in, Juice! The Steelers held Simpson to only 49 yards, but the defense did not stop him alone. What happened was our offense won that game. Our offense just took over, and Buffalo could not give the ball to OJ. They didn't have time. By halftime, Terry Bradshaw was in the midst of the finest performance in his five-year career. He's now reaching that level where he's relaxed, he can execute, and it, and it was just a beautiful thing to see. Just you when you get I... around, just slow down so I can hit you like a hook. Okay. And well, we got all kind of running room. Yeah. Bradshaw's back. The rush is on. He has to unload it. He lets the Blyer. Blyer going in for the touchdown. Now what we are seeing is three weeks of solid performance by everyone after that Houston debacle. And this is where, you know, the, the attitudes start to build. This year, of course, our, our main goal is to, is to get to and win the Super Bowl. And we knew that when, in order to do that, we were going to have to, uh, or will have to beat Miami. And whether it's the first game or the second game, it, it really doesn't make any difference. They're the world champions. Uh, you know, they're a great football team. In a game that lived up to its hype, the Raiders defeated the two-time defending Super Bowl champion Dolphins on a last-minute touchdown that went into NFL lore as the Sea of Hands. 
Oakland had won the so-called Super Bowl eight and a half. But in the aftermath, they might have lost Super Bowl IX when Raiders coach John Madden went a little too far in his praise of both teams. John Madden been quoted as saying when the two best teams in football, Miami Dolphins and Oakland Raiders, get together, great things will happen. Hey, I have to admit, that was a great game. <laughs> it was a great game, <laughs> all right? Two great teams. But when they already accepted the crown, that didn't sit well with us. And, and, and even though they beat us earlier in the season, you know, that was like, so what? Okay, we weren't at our best at that time, and we're kind of like a new team here now, right? With, with, with some new spirit. Of all people, it was the Steelers' stoic head coach who galvanized that new spirit. Chuck made a comment, didn't raise his voice, but the, his voice did change when he said that uh, the best team in the National Football League didn't play yesterday. And the Super Bowl wasn't played yesterday. The Super Bowl is going to be played in two weeks, and the best football team in the league is sitting here in this room. Wow. I mean, everybody just went crazy. Joe Green was sitting right next to me, and he just sort of rose up out of this, this little uh, desk chair, you know, and kind of stood up in the desk chair and had draped to his legs. And he was ready to play right, right then. He was so psyched. I mean, I've never seen Chuck Noll do an emotional thing like this. It was out of character for him to say things like that. But it was right on the money, it was what we needed. It didn't matter who we played, where we played them, they were gonna lose. And Bradshaw on the draw gives it to Harris straight to the middle and into the end zone for a Pittsburgh touchdown. Stabler's back to throw, and it is intercepted. There's an interception by Jack Hamm. Madden was very much like Chuck, Chuck Noll. He wanted to dominate the, the sticks. He wanted to move the ball on the ground. And we knew we were going to have to stop that run. And they had a great offensive line. Half of them are Hall of Famers. You got Gene Upshaw and Art Shell. Uh, and Ernie steps over the ball and he said, Eugene! Upshaw! Upshaw finally turns around because he was in the huddle. <laughs> and Ernie said, I'm going to kick you. Ernie Holmes had plenty of help. The Steelers rushed for over 200 yards. The Raiders rushed for 29. Their running game didn't have a chance. They were just bewildered. You've heard people brag about a lot of things, and they talk about being in the zone. They don't know what the hell the zone is about. Because you don't get there, you don't live in the zone. You, you, you visit the zone probably once in your life. And I don't want to trivialize it because it didn't happen. And I played 13 years, I was in the zone one time. And I think our team was in the zone. Late in the fourth quarter, Franco Harris's second touchdown sealed Pittsburgh's first trip to the Super Bowl. Then scoring again and knowing that we got it, it was unbelievable. That was the uh, most euphoric uh, moment the, I, I, I think I'd, I'd ever felt on a football field. That precise moment when you know that the next ball game will be in the Super Bowl. It's, it's, it is, oh man, it just, it just doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better than that. I tell people that that was the biggest game of the whole 70s team. It made us realize that we're a really good football team. And right now, we're probably the best. And, and that really set the tone for what was to come for the rest of the decade.
Chuck Knoll was an assistant coach for the Baltimore Colts when they lost to the New York Jets in Super Bowl III. Knoll believed the Colts were too tight before that game. So he took no chances when his Steelers went to New Orleans. Early in the week, he said, go out and no bed check. Get this town out of your system. So we took him up on that little challenge. We had a good time in New Orleans. Dwight didn't. Me, Dwight, Elsie, and Ernie, we threw the bags in the room and went right down to Bourbon Street and ordered all the strength that they ever had. <laughs> then at the end of that, uh, Dwight was ill. And uh, we, he ended up going to the hospital and, you know, we thought he'd been sabotaged. <laughs> By Wednesday, we were begging for a bed check. We were, we were tired. The way Chuck approached it, I think, made all the difference in the world. The time he gave us, responsibility that he gave us, was, to me, a wonderful way to approach it. Knoll's approach was in direct contrast to that of Vikings coach Bud Grant, whose team had lost two previous Super Bowls. The Vikings were stuck out at the airport. They had a bed check early. They didn't have the fun. They didn't have the relaxed atmosphere for the first three or four nights. So I think that was important because we went into that game, I think, far more relaxed than the, the Vikings. The difference between the two teams was evident when Steelers safety Glenn Edwards ran into a former college teammate and current Viking in the tunnel before the game. Land in his southern draw. Hey, Boop. How you doing? Good luck. And the guy was a stone face, looking straight ahead. Wouldn't, wouldn't even look at me. He said, hey. I said, I said, hello, I'm speaking to you. And the guy wouldn't say anything to him. And he gets in between him. He pushes in between him, and he says, OK, bub, buckle up then. And the game was on. Right behind Joe Green was number 78, Dwight White, who spent the week in the hospital and lost 20 pounds. You know, I guess we're trying to humor him because we know he's not going to play. When we go through our warm-ups, when we take a, you know, a headbutt, we clash together. And I thought he was going to, you know, fall and pass out, but he, he hung in there, you know. White more than hung in there. He started and played most of the game. He even scored the only two points of the first half on a safety. How he managed to play that day and how he managed to play as well as he played, it's... I don't know if he knows. Our attitude as a defense was, we're going to win this game 2-0. I mean, that's, that's it. The Steelers shut down the Minnesota ground game just as they had to Buffalo and Oakland. The Vikings ran the ball 20 times for a total of 17 yards. Quarterback Fran Targenton fared no better. He completed just 11 of his 27 passes and threw three interceptions. I had accepted one. Didn't run very far. Franco Harris ran further than anyone ever had in the Super Bowl. He set a record with 158 rushing yards and was named the game's most valuable player. My wildest dreams during the season it was like scoring a touchdown on the Super Bowl, for the thing from my mind. And, and here it is. Great shot, giving it to Harris, getting a key block for Mullins, running to the left, running to the right, touchdown for Pittsburgh. Harris running wide to the left, walking into the end zone for the touchdown, and the Steelers are on the board with their first TD of the afternoon. Harris's coronation was Terry Bradshaw's validation. With the Steelers clinging to a three-point fourth-quarter lead, the game was in the quarterback's hand. Got two yards to go on third down. He's going to pass. Terry Bradshaw fires, and it's caught at the 40. Holy smoke! Bradshaw engineered a seven-minute drive that finished off the Vikings and laid to rest any remaining doubts in the blonde bomber. There's a touchdown here. I can't see it all. Brad throws a strike. I'll never forget that. He hit Larry Brown in the chest, and you could hear it ricochet off his breastplate. 
sounded throughout that stadium as though it was a gun going off. Sounded like a cannon had gone off. Maybe it was my heart, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody was, anyone was, was, was as happy as Terry was. Terry had more ups and downs after that, but that probably gave him the, the confidence, the staying confidence that regardless of how things come out, that you're still good enough to play. But it wasn't Bradshaw or any player who got the game ball for a victory four decades in the making. Would have been a natural to give it to Franco as MVP or give it to, uh, you know, Joe Green or LC. But I, I thought, we, you know, we got to give it to, to the Chief. You could almost see tears in his eyes. I think I had tears in my eyes. And I had such respect for that gentleman. To see him after all those years to rise to the top of the mountain was quite an experience. Mr. Rosette presenting that award, that trophy to, to Mr. Rooney, you could see that his glasses got fogged up. It was a special moment for him, for sure, because this was it. It was a long journey, a long journey. The same could be said for all of them. There it is. That's the 1974 Super Bowl IX. I was part of two Super Bowl victories, and, and some people asked me, why don't you wear the second ring? I said, well, the second ring, it, the first one's so much harder to win than the second one. I mean, once you've done it, then you think you can, you, you know you can do it, because you've done it. And it's, uh, and so I think the first one was uh, the, the absolutely quintessential moment of all Steeler time, and it will remain so. The something that champions have, that you can only get by being in it, getting kicked around until you say you don't want to get kicked around anymore. I think that's what happened over the course of that 74 season. Chuck probably knew better than anybody that at that point in time, he had a team that would compete for years for that Super Bowl trophy because we got a taste of it. We got a taste of it. For additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game. Chuck Knoll's first task was to change a culture of losing that had festered throughout the 60s. Back in the early 60s, with Buddy Parker as the coach, he allowed certain freedoms and certain attitudes that were certainly a lot different than what Chuck Knoll would have allowed. And I remember one time they had us run a, a mile course through the woods, and as we ran down the hill, half the veteran players took out cigarette packs out of their shorts and lit up a smoke, and all the rookies ran through the woods, and we came back after the mile run, and they jumped back in the thing and sprinted up the hill, and, and the coaches thought they'd done the run. And I was thinking, how, how could this possibly be? The first practice, after he'd given that tough speech, all the players you know, gathered around him and sort of acted almost in a collegiate fashion, started making a lot of noise and shouting and yelling and showing enthusiasm. And he said, wait a minute, quiet. I don't want any noise out here. He said, that is pseudo chatter. You know, half the guys didn't even know what pseudo meant, but basically he was saying, I don't give any credit for gung ho doesn't win games. You know, I can't ever recall an encounter with Chuck about getting tossed out of a ball game. The time that I remember him having a conversation with me was during training camp. I wanted to get my equipment, but the equipment room was, was closed. 
And I, you know, kicked the door down and got my equipment and went to the, my room. And Chuck came by later and said, that'll be $500. That's all he said. That'll be $500. Obviously, I'm guessing, but I don't know if anyone would have tolerated my behavior the way Chuck did. My college career, I tell people, it wasn't great, but it was good. I mean, it, I mean, it was a good, solid college career. Franco Harris wasn't the most celebrated running back at Penn State. That was Lydell Mitchell, number 23. Lydell always had dreams about being a pro, and that was his goal. And myself, pro football was not part of my plan. I never talked about it. And then my senior year, people were saying, well, frankly, you'll probably get drafted. And I was pretty surprised about that. He was more surprised when the Steelers made him the 13th pick of the draft, the first running back taken, ahead of Lydell Mitchell. But Franco envied Mitchell, who was drafted by the mighty Baltimore Colts in the second round. I was just crying. So, oh, man, I'm with the Pittsburgh Steelers. You're going to Baltimore Colts. They make the playoff every year, and you'll be doing well. You'll be making extra money going into the playoffs, and, and look where I'm going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. But I do remember going to my first practice out there and watching the running backs, and I was saying to myself, oh, my God, I can never make this team. Franco has an odd way about him. You know, he'd run up to the, run up to the offensive line, he'd stop. And he'd peek around, and then, you know, defensively, you know, we'd look at him and say, what is he going to do? Then we're going back to the huddle, he takes off, runs to the goal line. I said, gee, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of Franco. I, I'd been a fullback in college, so I knew a little bit about, you know, running the football, and, and I kind of was uh, a little bit disappointed in training camp. He just, he, he seemed uh, out of sorts. He wasn't, maybe he was making mistakes and things that, you, that will happen to rookies. I don't know if I was the only one scratching my head wondering, say, what, who is this guy? The rookie won over his teammates in the last game of the preseason. We played a game, I think it was in uh, Atlanta, Fulton County, and Franco runs up to the line, looks like he stops and maybe scratches his head, what am I gonna do now? And all of a sudden he goes, <laughs> takes off. And I said, gee, we got one, <laughs> we got one. You can tell it when you see it, you can even see it in your body languages. By the language of a, of a player tells you how intense, how involved they are in the contest. And Franco was involved in the contest. And that means that you're in it. And you're going to do whatever you have to do to get it done. Fourth down and 10 yards to go. The Oakland Raiders have taken a 7-6 lead in a tough, tough football game that has featured nothing but staunch defense all afternoon. Hang on to your hats. Here come the Steelers out of the huddle. It's not going to end this way. You know, it's not going to end this way. And I'm saying that because of the season that we have. Just such a, a beautiful season. I looked down because I thought the season's over. I just sort of cast my eyes down. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to, fires it downfield. And there's a collision. That's, got, that's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. Five seconds left on the clock. Franco Harris holds the football. I don't even know where he came from. I think by the time Franco got across the goal line, I think I was pretty close. There are people in the end zone. Where did he come from? For a lot of things, there is preparation. And when something happens, it might look like it's just something happened that moment, but sometimes just a little thought can change the outcome of something. And at Penn State, Joe Paterno always mentioned, 
go to the ball, go to the ball. And when I got to the Steelers, all those little things that uh, they would say, I would, okay, it makes sense now. At Penn State, my freshman and sophomore year, we were number two twice. We were never number one. And now I had a burning desire to be on a number one team. The next Sunday, we ended up losing to Miami, but, but we really set a, a, a new standard and a great foundation for what was to come. And I told my teammates, I said, look, after the game, we get back. We'll get back early in the morning. I'm gonna have steak and eggs at my place. That's what I told them, and champagne. Steak, eggs, and champagne. I knew we were gonna bring that game home. There was a play, Stallworth is running down the right sideline. He catches a pass in his left hand, tiptoed down the sideline. Caught the ball and then saw. Out of bounds. Uh, the feeling that I had, and I think we all had, was didn't matter. We're gonna still beat you. We got home that night after the game. It was like maybe I'm trying to think, it was two in the morning or three in the morning. And I mean it was and we weren't tired at all. I mean, we were just feeling great, and, and some of the guys came on over and had steak and eggs and champagne, and we partied till the morning. The Steelers' defense did not allow a point in Pittsburgh's 16-6 Super Bowl IX victory. Minnesota's only score came on a blocked punt. The Vikings missed the extra point. They just wasted a lot of downs trying to run the ball, and uh, they just were sort of lined up and said, here, we're coming, and we can beat you guys physically, and they, they couldn't, and they found that out. Fran, what we wanted to do with him was to keep him in the pocket. Fran probably was only 5'10", maybe 5'11". He throws the ball, he throws it. But don't let him outside of the pocket where he can buy time. And that was when he was at his best. We were just trying to keep him bottled in. And I think LC probably batted two, three balls that day. The defense did it mostly without linebackers Jack Lambert and Andy Russell, who both left the game with injuries. I was really proud of myself. I'd never miss a game in high school, college, or pro. And I, I played a lot of games hurt, because that's what you do. I mean, you have to. When I got hurt in the Super Bowl, I leg whipped one of their running backs, and it caused a, a, a tremendous uh, pain in my leg. My leg went numb. But I thought I could stay in and play. I could hobble around and play. But, you know, I realized in about two plays that that was a bad decision. That uh, Russell, get your ego out of this. This is the Super Bowl. We don't need you out here trying to you know, hold some record. Standing on the sideline, as I, as I realized the, the, the seconds were, were running out and we were going to actually win this Super Bowl, Ray Mansfield, who was also one of the, uh, he was probably the guy from the, on the offense who, who, who bridged that gap between the 60s and the 70s. We hugged and he said, you know, Andy, he said, we, we, we finally reached the top of the mountain. And uh, it, it was just a, a great analogy. And uh, we felt so uh, blessed to just have been part of it. I mean, to, you know, we didn't give ourselves much credit because, you know, we saw these gifted, brilliant athletes come in in the 70s and, you know, how much impact did we have on them? You know, I mean, I'd like to claim that I taught Lambert and Ham everything they, they know, but I'm not going to be able to sell anybody on that, I don't think. So, so we just were, were blessed to be a part of it and have that experience. After being benched in favor of Terry Bradshaw, Joe Gilliam's life took an unfortunate and ultimately tragic turn. Well, after Joe got benched, he, he started having some, some problems. And uh, if, if, I would, all I would see is he would be late for meetings and he was uh, 
doing some erratic behavior and, and things that were inexplicable to, you know, a player that wanted to still stay in the good graces of the coach. So, so I, I was uh, concerned that uh, he, he, he was struggling with this uh, on an emotional basis. No, no player would ever want to get benched. I mean, obviously it's, it's a, an horrendous thing. And I think that Joe, uh, you know, he struggled with that the rest of his life. No, that was a very tough time for Joe. I mean, Joe felt very hurt and disappointed. And uh, so I mentioned to Joe, hey, look, you have a lot of career left, OK? You have a bright future, OK? Just, I mean, just settle down a little bit, OK? You'll, uh, you know, you'll have chances to play. But neither his friend Franco Harris nor anyone else could slow a spiral into alcoholism and drug addiction. Gilliam was out of the NFL within two years and struggled with substance abuse for the rest of his life. He died from a heart attack in 2000. You know, we spent some time together and had a lot of fun together. And, and you know, it was good to hear about his dreams and what he wanted to do. And, and, uh, and, and then sometimes he tried to talk to someone, but they're going down a certain path and 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 I wasn't going there. So uh uh so we kind of uh as 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 things went on uh you know we just uh started going a little bit more our uh, own ways. locker room of the victors and we have of course the commissioner the head coach and mr rooney commissioner well, mr rooney for over 42 years you've been making more friends i think than anyone in the history of sports if i had to guess right now i would say that your strongest emotion would not be one of a personal happiness but happiness and relief for those fans in pittsburgh and your friends all over the country that your team and your organization didn't let them down today. And on behalf of all of them, I'd like to extend my warmest congratulations to you, your great coach, Chuck Knoll, your son and president, Dan, and the entire family, and a great, great football team. Thanks, Pete. I'm grateful to the players and to Chuck Knoll and his staff and to all the people in our organization that this was a great day for me personally and a great day for Pittsburgh. But the players and the coaches all year long thought that they would get this trophy. And I'm certainly grateful to them all. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. I know that so many people that want to visit with you and so much happiness, and there's so many tears in this locker room, and they're all of joy for you, sir. Well, I certainly appreciate it because they're a great bunch of fellas, and I thought that uh, just from being with them all year and being with Chuck Knoll and his staff that I'm not a bit surprised that they won the Super Bowl. And we're awfully happy for you, sir. Thank you a lot. I know you want to get down with the ball players, and let me move over and talk with Chuck. Number one. Congratulations, Coach. Thank you very much. Boy, it's a big day. Go back a long way in professional football. Fifteen years now. <laughs> I, 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 I shudder to think of it. <laughs> yes. yes. Everything went, obviously, the way that, the way that you planned. Well, <laughs> you'd like to say that, but uh, obviously they don't. Uh, we had a few mistakes out there, but uh, I think our football team uh, was functioning pretty much like they have all year. They're, they just weren't going to be denied, and uh, they played that kind of uh, uh, football. I think uh, probably in our minds, you know, the most fitting thing about this whole thing was that uh, our defense was able to shut out a uh, team in the championship game in the Super Bowl. I thought that was, uh, I think, demonstrative of the way our team was all year. A great defensive team, our offense doing whatever it had to do to, to maintain possession and win the game. 
the only selection, not the only selection, but one of the selections, and you know, when people were deciding whether you should be the favorite or whether Vikings would be the favorite, is that they would use history. And that the fact that the team basically that had been here before and had been through, you know, the circus of Super Bowl week, you know, this didn't seem to bother your ball club at all. No, as I said going in, they just weren't going to be denied. They had it in their mind that they wanted it very badly and whatever cost or whatever it was, however hard they had to go, they were going to get it. When he, when he stepped up, I said, you know, I said, mean Joe Green, and you have stated that your name is Joe Green, and you said, to, what did you say today? Call me anything you want to say. <laughs> I like that. Please call. Number, just Number call one. Me. All right. John? <laughs> well, I've been quoting you all week. Whether it's right or not, I'm really not sure. I guess I should have checked with you but first. But you were quoted as, as having said that the anticipation of achieving something had never been as great as the accomplishment. And they were asking you about the Super Bowl. And now I have the opportunity to ask you, Joe Green, you've accomplished the Super Bowl. You say, you know, I'm a proud man and I want to try to do my work. What does the Super Bowl mean to you, man? Fantastic. It's fantastic. It's, yes, you know, my, out and beyond my wildest dreams, I didn't think you could get this big a charge at him. I really didn't have a football and had a Super Bowl game. I sit and watch it. I watched it for nine years and envied the people that played it. I, didn't, I just didn't think you could get that bigger charge out of it, and it's even uh -huh. bigger than I, I thought it would be. Well, I'm glad for you, man. Thank you. You mentioned earlier in the week that you were going to go to. you ran out of air. Somehow you didn't run out of any today, Dwight, and what went yeah, on? I was lucky today. Uh, uh, I got out of the hospital on yesterday, and yeah, I just couldn't miss it. This was too big. Well, you don't look sick. <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I feel sick. I'm pretty sick. <laughs> You got a you got a rookie that slipped in there behind you. Know, you guys let that rookie slip in there. Super rookie yeah, has done it. Run. You got you hurt a little bit today, didn't you? Yeah, I uh, sprained my ankle pretty bad in the first part of the second or first half, and uh, I don't know. I I felt that if I stayed in, you know, I'd hurt the team more, so I I decided to stay out. It's got to be a team man. Jack Lemmon has done a heck Ernie, of a job. Ernie, can, all can year we long. do something? Now we've heard so much this week about Arrowhead. You think we can get one little peek? One peek. Oh, would you tough. like to see it? I'm going to retire until next year now. That's why it's the Super Bowl. Ernie, you had a great day, I'll tell you.